Hello and welcome to the 26th Geopolitical Economy Hour, the show that examines the fast-changing political and geopolitical economy of our times. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. And working behind the scenes to bring you our show every fortnight are our host, Ben Norton, our videographer, Paul Graham, and our transcriber, Zach Weiser. In our last two shows, we looked at China's economy and where it was headed, busting major Western myths about it and highlighting the differences between the Chinese and US economies that explain the dynamism of the former and the productive decline of the latter. We spoke about how China was embarked on engineering the next industrial revolution through a major structural transformation, uh, not only to continue its high growth, but also to improve its quality technologically and in human terms. Giving, uh, and, and, and in doing this, China is increasingly taking the technological lead in more and more frontier sectors, including green technology, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. In today's show, we look at how the United States is responding to this structural transformation of China's economy. Our short answer is badly. It keeps military and diplomatic tensions high, continues provocative visits of high-ranking officials to Taiwan, and tries to stoke up trouble between China and its neighbors, and rings China around with new military alliances. It continues its economic provocations against China that fill the headlines these days, interrupted only as with the recent phone call between Presidents Biden and Xi and visits of Secretaries of Treasury and State to China by sort of, sh sort of shows of uh, attempting to cooperate with China. The fronts of the economic attack are proliferating. The Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, Huawei, TikTok, electronic vehicles, solar panels, steel and shipbuilding, and the matter of China's consumption and the world market's overcapacity. No doubt there will be more. The fundamental cause is pretty clear. The United States had sought to engage China in the closing decade of the last century under the delusion that such engagement would result in the complete and snug subordination of China's economy to US capital. However, by the end of that decade, the BRICS thesis already signaled problems and halfway into the first decade of the new century, the economic war with China had begun. President George Bush slapped 30% tariffs on Chinese steel. This was followed by President Obama's pivot to Asia, President Trump's trade and technology war, and now President Biden's widening hybrid war on China. As National Security uh, Advisor Jake Sullivan frankly admitted in a speech last April, the US has had to contend with the reality of a large non-market economy, that a large non-market economy has been integrated into the international economic order in a way that posed considerable challenges. Of course, President Bush was forced to rescind his tariffs less than a year later, and the US corporate capitalist class remains highly divided on the exact policies to adopt towards China. Over the brief decade or so of engagement, substantial parts of the US corporate capitalist class had become deeply reliant on China, on its workers, on its suppliers, and even on its markets. No complete break is really possible. This is finessed in public discourse by splitting hairs, such as, for instance, shifting from talking about decoupling to talking about de-risking. However, however, those for continued engagement are opposed by two powerful forces. There are the sectors of the capitalist class that are threatened by China's technological advances, such as Google and Meta, and they are leading the anti-China charge. On the other hand, US ruling circles, which continue to pursue corporate neoliberal policies designed for their benefit, need to offer the vast majority of working Americans who are suffering under these policies an explanation for their misery, and nothing is more useful than blaming China. So the technological and hybrid war continues, and today we want to discuss some of the key elements. And Michael and I thought we would begin by talking about Huawei. Michael, why don't you take that away? Well, the beginning really is uh, what uh, uh, America means by a non-market economy. It means an economy that is better at competing internationally than the United States. 
uh, it's not a market economy if uh, the United States can't uh, uh, gain control of it and uh, do something better. And uh, that's the problem that the United States had uh, with uh, Huawei ever since uh, the U.S. began to move its industry under the Clinton administration to China. Uh, the United States can't compete in industrial products, and it only has a few raw materials, oil, gas, and uh, uh, agricultural uh, exports uh, to support the balance of payments. That leaves only one way that the United States can uh, balance its payments enough so that it can afford all of the 800 plus military bases that it has all over the world and can afford to fight uh, in uh, the Ukraine, uh, in Palestine, and in the uh, China Sea. So the uh, solution is it, it needs economic rent. It needs to mon monopolize some high growth area of the economy that uh, other countries are not allowed to compete in. Well, uh, one of the great growth areas is, of course, the move towards uh, 5G uh, uh, communications technology. Uh, and Huawei is way ahead uh, of the United States there. That's why it was being uh, adopted everywhere. Uh, what could the United States do? It couldn't really compete. So it asked Canada to uh, place under arrest the daughter of uh, uh, the uh, head of Huawei and uh, said, well, we're you know essentially going to keep you under home arrest until you agree uh, to let us have this technology. Uh, we don't want anyone else to have a technology that is growing that we can't control because that's a threat to our national security. And Huawei was a threat to national security because uh, if the United States can't get its market, how is it ever going to have uh, a market enough to support the balance of payments and be uh, uh, the unique uh, uh, country? Uh, and uh, Huawei was sort of the first symptom uh, of all of this. And it, uh, in fact, it's just posted its uh, largest and fastest growth on record. Uh, and from the U.S. point of view, uh, the U.S. investors don't control it. And the bankers are not, U.S. bankers are not making the loans to it. So there's no way that the United States can benefit uh, from Huawei. The, the problem is that the beneficiary is Chinese. Uh, and that is not what America had in mind uh, under Clinton when it uh, thought of the grand opening to China. China was supposed to let American companies come in and to rely on American banks to uh, expand. And that's not uh, what uh, highway, Huawei has done. So the umbrella uh, uh, legal and political uh, excuse for trying to uh, exclude Huawei and to bring pressure on uh, the European countries and America's NATO allies not to use Huawei is national security. And the Energy and uh, Commerce Committee of the United States issued a report a little while ago, and uh, it said, quote, foreign adversaries have, uh, have used uh, access to data to disrupt America's uh, daily lives, to conduct espionage activities, and to push disinformation and propaganda campaigns in an attempt to undermine our democracy and gain global influence and control. Well, the problem is that con control is the key. Uh, Huawei did not let the uh, National Security Agency and the CAA have a back door into its uh, products. And uh, if the United States cannot uh, listen to what uh, uh, people say over Huawei, uh, it, it gets very insecure. We don't know what other people are saying. Uh, it's sort of like uh, silk making. Uh, the West tried a long time to get uh, silk worms uh, from China so that you, uh, you could bring it to Europe and Finally, some priests uh, brought some silkworms, uh, and Italy's silk, uh, silk uh, industry uh, started all that. Well, the United States would like to do the same thing with uh, Huawei, uh, to turn technology into a rent-extracting monopoly, intellectual property uh, privilege, and it wants to steal China's platform, to make a long story short. No, this is so true, Michael. And I, I, I just thought I would make a, a couple of a few points really to, to, to reinforce what you're saying, because as you say, the United States is insistent on keeping its, uh, its monopolies, and, uh, and this insistence arises from the fact that increasingly the leading sectors 
of the US economy rely on the uh, on the sort of political imposition of monopoly. It is not a natural monopoly in the sense that uh, it's arrived at through out competing, you're successfully out competing rivals. So if you think about what are the leading sectors of the US economy, there's the military industrial complex, there's the fire, uh, uh, finance insurance and real estate sector, there's the big pharma, and there's information and communication technology. And if you think about it, the military industrial complex requires essentially the uh, 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 creation of uh, an artificial US monopoly by the expansion of NATO and the imposition of its interoperability requirements, which keeps expanding the market for the US defense producers, no matter how uh, bad they may be, how bad the quality of their products may be. Similarly, the fire sector relies on the international dominance of the dollar, which is of course threatened, but nevertheless, the United States keeps trying to do everything in its power to continue it. Big Pharma and ICT rely on patents and uh, and, and 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 copyrights and and and, and you know ba basically intellectual property rights. And those scholars who study intellectual property rights have pointed out that the United States is actually pursuing the wrong policy. If you want to keep and maintain a technological lead, you don't do it by trying to consolidate your existing technology or trying to back your existing technology with, uh, uh, with intellectual property rights. You do it by continuously innovating. And this is, in fact, Doing the first is actually the uh, counterproductive to doing the second because you're trying to retain an existing advantage rather than constantly developing new technological advantages. So in that sense, this is the wrong strategy. The United States is pursuing that strategy rather and, and I would say that China is pursuing the other. Um, uh, and and the fact that it and, and the other thing is that you know when the United States securitizes, everything. So, you know, in the name of uh, national security, the United States wants to give subsidies to all sorts of corporations to develop their products and R&D and what have you. And the fact of the matter is that this strategy, which really sort of confuses the issue, is far less effective. Uh, and therefore, the United States is losing the technological lead than the strategy that China adopts, which is really to focus on developing the technologies, whether security or civilian or whatever. And that's why, as you rightly pointed out, Michael Huawei has not spent much time worrying about the uh, ways in which the United States wants to restrict it by restricting the export of various types of chips and so on. Huawei has continued to innovate, and I have no doubt that even with the recent bad, the chip war and so on, the Chinese are actually going to not take very long before they will outcompete um, technologically the, the U.S. technological lead on 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 um, on uh, on chips. So and and finally, you you're so right. You know, you when you pointed out that the United States wants to spy on everyone, which is why it does not want tech, China Chinese companies. Which will not allow them to spy on uh, on the on the rest of the world to have any share of the world market in technologies where you can collect big data, etc. Because the United States government and all the major U.S. ICT corporations are already co cooperating with one another. The United States has access to our data, and the, the U.S. just does not want anybody else to uh, to have the same access. So this is what we are looking at. And of course, associated with this is the whole issue of TikTok. TikTok has also been named as a security uh, uh, threat, et cetera. So Michael, why don't we talk a little bit about TikTok? TikTok exemplifies uh, the distinction between uh, what you call the wrong strategy and the right strategy. Your idea of the right strategy is long-term research and development. But uh, for the financial sector in the United States, that's the wrong strategy. Uh, because uh, if you spend money on research and development, you cannot use it to, buy, uh, to pay dividends and to buy stock uh, buy products. But stock buybacks. The financial sector lives in the short term. So you're really uh, saying that uh, the U.S. follows a short-term financial strategy and China follows a long-term strategy of research and development. Well, that's what led to TikTok, and which uh, China says has a much more sophisticated uh, platform strategy than uh, the United States uh, uh, platforms have. And uh, th that's why TikTok threatens Silicon Valley's monopoly on its platforms. And it also... Uh, 
steals uh, the hopes to monopolize the social media. The United States hoped that uh, Facebook and X and the other platforms uh, would be monopolized and uh, what you call uh, intellectual property rights are really monopoly rights. Uh, and uh, they just don't like to call it because monopoly is a bad word, but uh, that's what America wants. And uh, America cannot uh, have a monopoly, right? If uh, uh, people right. are having the free choice to choose TikTok because it's created a better uh, overall system. And uh, uh, it's in 150 countries, it has a billion people and the uh, 170 million Americans and the United States can't control it. Uh, that, just like uh, with uh, Huawei, that's what upsets Washington. So the question is, how do you uh, make these 170 million Americans uh, when your technology uh, uh, can't be used uh, to, to use a back door. Uh, they, what they did was a number of things. They've accused China uh, and TikTok of uh, somehow having, uh, being a threat to national security because that's an umbrella that uh, can cover absolutely anything that you want. Well, China, uh, TikTok has spent a billion and a half dollars uh, with an American firm to ascertain that uh, there's no way in which China can have access to this. Uh, the United States uh, simply ignores this because the facts don't matter. Uh, it's it's uh, still, it's, it's a danger to the dollar and hegemon hegemony. And so the platform disturbs uh, Washington for a number of reasons. And uh, that's because of what can be said on it. Uh, uh, the the uh, government of Israel has especially complained to the United States that uh, there's a, a, a much more uh, opposition to the war in Palestine on TikTok than there is on Facebook and on X. And in fact, Facebook has censored uh, any defense of uh, uh, the Palestinians. And uh, for every three posts of support Palestine on TikTok, there's only one on Instagram or uh, the, the others. And uh, uh, the, so uh, Israel has told uh, Biden that this is a national security threat to the, uh, uh, the uh, duopoly between Biden and Netanyahu uh, for the uh, war to uh, drive out uh, the Palestinians to uh, control the, uh, the Near Eastern uh, uh, oil. And if you accuse uh, Israel of genocide, then that's a threat to US national security. And uh, where are these accusations? They're on TikTok because they're all censored on the other uh, platforms and the United States doesn't have censorship uh, powers uh, over uh, TikTok. So that's why it said you've got to sell to the United States Well, uh, or go out of business. Well, China has said we'd rather go out of business uh, and lose uh, the money that we have uh, are making in the United States and give you uh, the billions and billions of uh, dollars that uh, we've developed for the in for the programming for a TikTok so that you can use it for the and uh, take away our markets. You know, this is not going to be another case of the uh, silkworms uh, being lost uh, to the West. Uh, no. We're going to keep it. And a, a number of far right uh, Republicans are saying that uh, TikTok's a spying operation, and it, it doesn't matter what the reality is. Uh, they're they're, uh, they're just uh, accusing and uh, them. And of course, uh, you have Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary under Trump, saying that he's putting together a group of buyers to try to buy TikTok. Uh, he thinks he'll uh, be able to make it a killing. Uh, uh, and obviously, uh, that's not going to uh, happen. And it, uh, what's certainly not going to happen is the United States said is uh, sending uh, Yellen to China now to say, why don't you so send ByteDance, the overall worldwide operations? Then we can have, that's uh, what we want. Well, the United States has nothing to offer in exchange. It's just making the demand. And all that uh, it can really do uh, in the end is to close TikTok. And uh, we'll see what the uh, political effects of all that are, because obviously many of the uh, younger people uh, who already are uh, uh, disapproving of the Biden administration are uh, say, well, we want free speech. As long as the United States fight uh, is leading the world fight against free speech, uh, then uh, uh, 
Uh, you can, you, I'll let you finish. <laughs> what the hell that means? Yeah, no, no, uh, exactly. I mean, I think that what the United States would dearly like, as you say, is to totally monopolize social media because then the ability of the United States to essentially dominate the information space would be vastly enhanced because all the uh, uh, social media companies would essentially be parroting what the United States says. So it wants to eliminate any possibility that there will be any other type of information that will be available. But of course, this is not going to happen that easily because in addition to the social media, as we know, uh, China, Russia, and many other countries too have increasingly been uh, 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 creating their own uh, uh, information space uh, 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 and, in, uh, uh, you know, in cre uh, creating their own media companies and so on, which put forward a different point of view. And today, along with all sorts of alternative news websites, these websites are part of the information space for those who are who realize that the mainstream media does not give you the correct view and they would like to try and see what what other views there are. So, you know, whether it is Global Times or CGTN or RT or various news, Indian news media websites, they do provide a different perspective. There are a couple of other points I, one should make about this. Um, it was, uh, you know, remember that Trump originally proposed a ban on TikTok. And in the course of discussions about that, many people uh, uh, said that, oh, well, TikTok is very addictive and harmful and so on. Well, in China, uh, uh, the social media is actually controlled a lot more. In, in, and in, in the US, because the social media are essentially vast, uh, uh, you know, essentially belong to big corporations whose right to make profits are never to be challenged, uh, the United States refuses to regulate social media, whereas China regulates it. China has rules and regulations to protect children from harm, etc. And China will not say anything if the United States wishes to protect its children, not only from any uh, adverse effects of TikTok, but, but also any other social media. But the United States refuses to do that. A uh, second point is that, you know, not only is it true that um, uh, uh, TikTok is is one of the relative one of the few uh, social media uh, websites where you can voice criticism of what Israel is doing in Palestine, etc. But it is also true that because of this freedom, younger people are it, it basically users of TikTok disproportionately, and their importance in the coming election is going to be huge. Uh, they they have become very critical of the Biden administration, and in recognition of this. President Biden himself, on the one hand, says that he will sign into law uh, 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 any law against TikTok, which is passed by Senate now that it's already been passed by the House. But why, on the one hand, he says that, on the other hand, he has himself acquired a TikTok account. Another point that one should make as well is that, you know, TikTok is often regarded as a Chinese company. It's not a Chinese company. Its CEO is based in Singapore. What's more, a number of U.S. investors would stand to lose from TikTok, which is why I don't think it's very clear that Senate is going to pass this legislation. Um, among the U.S. investors that have a fair bit invested in TikTok are the following companies that I've just made this list from reading several different sources. They include BlackRock, Fidelity, General Atlantic, Sequoia Capital, Susquehanna, Kotu Management, and T. Rowe Price. So, you know, we know that uh, in the House, the, uh, the uh, 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 legislation got passed chiefly because um, of the concern over uh, criticism of Israel, but it remains to be seen exactly what happens. And I completely agree with you, Michael. I think that if it comes to it and Senate does pass this law and President Biden signs it into law, I don't think the Chinese are going to sell TikTok. I think they would rather just shut down TikTok. So, We've talked about Huawei, we've talked about um, uh, TikTok. And by the way, I should remind you that, you know, there are also disagreements between uh, different so-called U.S. allies. You know, I'm reminded that the some years ago, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, when it was first floated, the British government actually joined the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, even though President Obama very loudly asked them not to. So there are, you know, not only is the U.S. capitalist class divided, but U.S. and its allies are also divided on many fronts. But now let's come to the next 
point, you know, uh, that we want to discuss, which is the whole matter of U.S. steel and U.S. shipbuilding. You know that the United Steel Workers has made a petition uh, 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 to, to the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine uh, Catherine Tai, and uh, and Catherine Tai has agreed to look look at this. Um, uh, and take it very seriously because, and he, let me just share here uh, um, a, a brief uh, a statement by her. You see here a uh, Catherine Tai's statement where uh, in response to the United Steel Workers uh, uh, petition, she pointed out that we have seen the People's Republic of China create dependencies and vulnerabilities in multiple sectors like steel, aluminum, solar, uh, batteries and critical minerals harming American workers and businesses and creating real risks for our supply chains. I look forward to reviewing this petition in detail. So once again, here we have another instance of blaming China for the misery of US workers, which is actually created by neoliberal policies. Wouldn't you agree, Michael? Yeah, so the United States policy is that it, uh, it, it has to control all key areas on national security grounds. Uh, and I think the reason is, the US, we've talked before, the U.S. plan is to go to war with China in 10 years. Uh, and you want to prepare for that. If uh, all of a sudden you went to war and you were still depending on China uh, for uh, goods, that would disrupt the United States economy. So the United States wants to prepare for this war, uh, presumable war with China, by uh, separating as much as you can right now. And that begins with steel. And it's not only uh, independent from China, but uh, with uh, from Japan too. Uh, you, you, what's been most in the news here is that uh, uh, Japanese companies want to buy US steel, which used to be the major uh, steel uh, in, industry uh, uh, in, in the country. And uh, again, the United States is claiming that even though Japan is our uh, satellite, our, uh, our uh, ally, it, it, it doesn't want it. So that Nippon Steel uh, offers uh, $15 billion to acquire U.S. steel. Uh, the uh, Biden administration opposes this. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump uh, already has uh, threatened to uh, block uh, the Nippon deal. Uh, and uh, the uh, the present administration wants to do the same thing uh, because and the labor unions are involved because uh, U.S. Steel is a unionized shop and uh, the uh, the labor unions have uh, come out against uh, saying no we want a U.S. controller that we can uh, pressure uh, whether it's not only China it's Japan uh, it's everyone so the U.S. Uh, limiting its uh, imports from uh, China is is against the entire world. And the only reason China's mentioned is it's the main uh, company, that, a country that's able to produce these uh, imports. And uh, the, the United States is essentially, if it, uh, if it uh, cuts itself off from China in its attempt to be self-sufficient, it's going to essentially uh, cut itself off from the whole rest of the world that is trading with China. And uh, the United, this will not help the United States uh, compete because the steel workers in America, in order to get enough money to pay for their medical care, for their housing, uh, for what it costs to live in America, simply cannot compete with those of almost any other country, whether it's Japan or the United States. So uh, you have uh, it, it's good to look at steel as just an example of uh, how far the United States can uh, stretch the national security umbrella. Exactly. And you know, the fact of the matter is that U.S. The steel has been one of the earliest victims of the deindustrialization of the United States that set in uh, once Ronald Reagan came to power and began to uh, impose his neoliberal policies, his monetarist policies, you know, beginning with impos imposing the infamous W-shaped recession of the early 1980s. So, so the deindustrialization of the U.S. has begun then. Today, if you look at the shipbuilding industry, the major producers of of steel are not in the United States. They are in China. They are in Japan. They are in Korea and elsewhere. And by the way, the, the, the U.S. Uh, 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 steel workers um, petition refers specifically to shipbuilding. And here also, we see an astonishing decline of the United States. I just wanted to share uh, a few slides that, that show this. So let's look at this one in, to begin with. 
Um, so if you look at this slide, what you see is that the US is not a significant player in the global shipbuilding industry. This is from the Financial Times. And you see here that China accounts for nearly 50% of the world's shipbuilding, followed by South Korea, which accounts for another 30% and more, and China, which accounts for uh, uh, another 20% and more. So you can see that the rest of the uh, uh, in, uh, industrialized world, so to speak, or shall we say post-industrial world, accounts for tiny fractions of that. And among these, the United States is down here at the very bottom with hardly anything. And let me also show you another really interesting uh, uh, point here, which is the Forbes magazine reported that US shipbuilding is at its lowest ever ever how did you know this was the name of the story how did the u.s fall so far and in uh, in this story among other things forbes notes that a nation that was among the world's leaders in commercial shipbuilding at key junctures in its history today builds less than 10 vessels actual number of vessels for ocean going commerce in a typical year china by contrast builds over a thousand vessels every year. So you can see 10 versus 1,000. China's shipbuilding is 100 times bigger than the United States. The entire US registered fleet of ocean-going commercial ship numbers fewer than 200 vehicles out of a global total of 44,000. And this is despite trade flows to and from America exceeding a trillion dollars annually. So the United States is among the biggest trading nations in the world. It should own the ships that bring the goods that it buys and sells and take away the goods that it sells, but it does not do so. Uh, US registered ship carry barely 1% of the traffic that comes to the US. And then we have this uh, 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 graph, the decline of U.S. shipbuilding, which accelerated under Reagan, as we were just saying. So here you have two lines. The blue line is uh, commercial shipbuilding and the red line is naval shipbuilding. So this is related to defense. And you can see that beginning in the, in the Reagan presidency, there has been a sharp decline in both with some improvement here, but these are just ordinary numbers of, of vehicle, uh, vessels. And you can see that the decline is really quite massive because even if these numbers show some recovery here, they are minuscule compared to the world totals. So this is the sorry uh, state of US industry of which shipbuilding is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I can't add anything to that, uh, uh, ex except the uh, the Forbes article went on to say, uh, or a follow-up article on uh, saying that navies are obsolete. Uh, if China is able to uh, send uh, a, a million drones against any kind of U.S. naval vessel, no U.S. naval vessel is safe given the modern technology where it's so easy to build a, a drone or a rocket to wipe out an aircraft carrier, or a, a battleship or even a submarine. So I think the United States is uh, uh, smart enough to give up on uh, the idea of naval wel welfare, uh, warfare, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens in the China Sea. Uh, as we, uh, I mean, I think that that, that, that point, I, th I think, is a quite an interesting one because, of course, today, uh, destructive capacity is very widely spread. You know, so you have Turkey and Iran building very, very high technology drones. And this this just shows that actually the uh, uh, since the ability to inflict harm is now so widely spread around the world, it makes very little sense to make enemies around the world the way the United States is going around doing. I think to me, that's the main lesson. That does not, however, mean that um, control over... Uh, transportation routes and so on is not an important part of a, 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 a essentially uh, a important part of securing your country's interests and so on. There has been historically very few powers that have not controlled transport logistics and China has certainly uh, not only increased its shipbuilding capacities, but also increased its uh, carrying capacity, the number of ships that China has. And increasingly, China also controls more and more ports around the world uh, and uh, it, uh, to whom, again, it is sort of distributing its logistics software, which is now being increasingly adopted by more and more ports around the world. So in that sense, I think that China certainly represents a challenge to the United States. And if China wishes, sorry, if the United States wishes to antagonize China, 
China has a lot of power and the which to in, in with which to uh, inflict harm. And I just want to add one final point. You know, the United States uh, has long been talking about having industrial policy, and obviously, with the uh, United Steelworkers petition around shipbuilding, the matter comes down to you know, can the United States pursue successful industrial policy? Uh, for example, to revive its shipbuilding. Um, and there again, we see that there are a number of obstacles the U.S. faces. After 40 years of neoliberalism, the United States has reduced itself to a position where even if it were to try to seriously engage in having an industrial policy to revive its industry, it would suffer from a number of obstacles. Number one, there is a lack of skills. You know, the the, the number of graduates that are uh, graduating in STEM uh, uh, subjects, the science um, technology, mathematics, etc., science, engineering, technology, and mathematics uh, are, are, are actually relatively few compared to other powers who are more serious about their industry, including China. There is also lack of suppliers. Uh, the tendency to have just-in-time production is simply not uh, conducive to having a, a reasonable industrial policy and building resilience. And finally, you have an entire capitalist class that requires high profits in the short term, whereas industrial policy requires being patient, accepting low profits for a long time before you your, your investment finally comes into, into stream and, and, and matures in order to deliver high profits. And none of these uh, uh, elements or aspects of successful industrial policy actually exist today in the United States. Well, that's uh, why Yellen, uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, is in China now. Shall we go in to discuss? Uh, Absolutely. Some... Go ahead, Michael. Well, uh, she's uh, essentially uh, there to make a number of demands. Uh, she's accusing China of uh, uh, pro monopolizing clean energy goods, uh, the battery technology, all the uh, things that you mentioned before. She says this is driving down the prices uh, of uh, global uh, uh, energy, of, glo of uh, batteries, of everything China produces. There's no way that American industry can compete with that. So you've got to stop uh, uh, exporting these things. Why don't you uh, just uh, support things for your own consumers? And uh, why don't you stop exporting? Uh, this is uh, almost uh, hilarious. Uh, and uh, she's used, uh, and the me media in America uses uh, a kind of vocabulary. I think uh, we, we should get used to a new uh, uh, word, it's not a new word, but it is in the dictionary, uh, and it's called uh, cockathemism. It's the opposite of a euphemism. A euphemism uh, paints lipstick on a pig. It, it makes um, something pretty bad look good. Well, Yellen has uh, gone through the entire vocabulary of cockathemism, making everything that China is doing good looking bad. For instance, she says it's ex to export is overproduction. Well, any country that exports produces something more than it produces at home. The only way to avoid overproduction by uh, uh, producing more than you do at home is not to export anything. That's what she's uh, asking China to do. Don't over, uh, overproduce, consume everything at home, stop making exports. Well, uh, that's a, a pretty crazy uh, thing. And uh, uh, according to Reuters, uh, U.S. Treasury officials said that the uh, 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 Yellen was going to, quote, make clear the global economic consequences of Chinese industrial overcapacity undercutting manufacturers in the U.S. and firms around the world. I couldn't have made that up for a, a description of uh, why the United States is so upset with China or any country that is following an industrial policy instead of a post-industrial policy. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, is approaching with its own agenda. Uh, it, Congress is using the word that uh, Yellen is going to use too, of dumping uh, and its uh, products. Well, dumping means selling below cost. And uh, Yellen's uh, the, the definition of selling below cost is anything that's not done by a market economy, meaning anything that's done with government support. 
Well, every economy that's successful is a mixed economy with government support. And in fact, China has uh, opened a complaint with the World Trade Organization challenging uh, Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which is uh, a huge subsidy of uh, hundreds of billions of dollars to try to uh, support U.S. information technology and chip making technology uh, and uh, to uh, China's protested the trade barriers that America's doing, uh, that America's leading the fight against the free trade that it was supporting as long as the United States after World War II could undersell Europe and other countries because there was a war uh, that, that destroyed their economies. But now that the United States can't undersell them, it, it says, well, you're dumping if your government helps you. Our government can help our agriculture with all of our huge government parity support for agriculture, for our uh, all the uh, special support we're giving for the war industry, uh, for all of these. But no other, if other countries' government can subsidize, or if China produces uh, public transportation at a much lower price in America. That's called uh, cheating uh, and uh, uh, dumping. Well, you can just see how the vocabulary is being twisted uh, and uh, uh, taken away. And uh, China, uh, Yellen has even accused China of currency manipulation because it, uh, when it gets uh, these dollars for uh, its exports, it, it buys, it, it puts them in the central bank and uh, holds U.S. Treasury bonds, just like uh, other central banks are dollarized. Well, there's no question China's trying to de-dollarize uh, as quick as it can. But of course, if it didn't hold the U.S. Treasury bonds, its currency would go way up. So by uh, manipulating currency, that means not letting its currency appreciate so much as to price China uh, exports out of the market, just like the Swiss currency uh, for uh, flight capital rose so much that Switzerland couldn't manufacture uh, industrial goods anymore. Uh, you're having a, a whole uh, a twisted vocabulary of American diplomacy. And uh, you're having a, a, a Reagan official, Robert Lichtauer, uh, 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 attributing part of the whole the whole blame uh, on China's uh, mercantile practices, which are simply the way that America, Germany, and every other country uh, got rich. Uh, Intel, uh, especially the, the firm that is uh, a foundry for uh, making chips and also designs, has asked for I think two hundred eighty billion dollars. Uh, of uh, support in the chips bill. So uh, I, I would imagine uh, some uh, Chinese official, if they actually sit down for lunch with Miss Yellen and uh, they can get in a word when she stops making demands, uh, can point out uh, uh, the double standard uh, that's being used. But uh, she doesn't care about the double standard. Uh, she'll just go, uh, you know, plow uh, right ahead and uh, say that, well, uh, uh, the fact is, uh, of course, uh, the uh, both use uh, government uh, uh, subsidies. Every country uses uh, has a government sector, uh, and the American government sector is, I think, forty percent uh, of the economy. Uh, so uh, there, uh, there's no such thing as a market economy without government, uh, because uh, the, uh, the, that's part of the government. So I think that uh, the warning, uh, Yellen is really there uh, to uh, make threats uh, and just say that, well, uh, we're going, uh, uh, Biden originally attacked Trump in the 2020 election. Uh, he attacked Trump saying, Trump raised exports and China's good. Looks how awful that is. Well, he came in in 2020 and he kept Trump's uh, uh, ex uh, tariffs on uh, uh, Chinese goods. And uh, now he's trying to raise the tariffs on Chinese goods, the exact opposite of what he said to do. Well, this is making the U.S. Uh, companies, especially the uh, information technology companies, scream because they said, wait a minute, if uh, we can't import goods from China, then we're going to have to raise our prices and we don't have the capacity to produce these uh, goods at home. There's going to be a huge interruption. Uh, and, uh, uh, and instead of, uh, we're going to have the effect now that it's as if you're gone to war already with China, not preparing for uh, 10 years to uh, try to pry uh, everything away. So Biden and uh, Yellen have nothing to offer China. Uh, I look forward to what the press will say about her trip there 
paper because uh, there's uh, really nothing that uh, uh, can be said except demands that China can just laugh at. China can say, well, if, if it really matters to you, instead of uh, you raising tariffs by 30%, I, I think they might say, why don't we just raise our, our export tariff by 30%? Uh, instead of the U.S. government treasury getting the uh, tariff proceeds, why don't uh, sh uh, why doesn't the Chinese government get the tariff proceeds? And for every uh, ten percent that America tax, uh, imposes illegal tariffs on China's goods, China should impose a matching uh, uh, ten percent uh, export charge on goods to the United States. Say, hey, you want to be independent? This is independent. Well, uh, th it's not exactly the kind of sanctions that NATO put against Russia, but uh, uh, that's the kind of war that we're going to get into. And the first victim, as usual, will be uh, the customers of China, uh, America and uh, presumably uh, the NATO countries of Europe, if America can convince them to uh, uh, import less from China, which NATO is already telling China, why don't you uh, 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 buy more from us? Uh, and balance the trade. And uh, I think China said, well, why don't you sell us the chip making equipment and all the good capital goods that Holland and other countries make? And uh, NATO says, well, we're not allowed to send you anything that uh, involves national security. So China, I think, will say, well, then I guess we have nothing to talk about. Right, uh, Michael. And I just wanted to uh, also uh, speak about Janet Yellen's uh, 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 visit and, and her claims about uh, Chinese dumping and so on, and raise a couple of slightly different points from the ones that you had raised. So let's look at this. So this is a, 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 from CNBC. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, on Wednesday warned that China is treating the global economy as a dumping ground for its cheaper clean energy products, depressing market prices and squeezing green manufacturing in the U.S., I'm uh -huh. concerned about global spillovers from the excess capacity that we are seeing in China. During a speech at a Georgia solar company called Suniva, China's overcapacity distorts global prices and production patterns and hurts American firms, workers, as well as firms and workers around the world. Now, there are a couple of things really worth looking at. Number one is that According to Yellen herself, she points out that China produces clean energy products more cheaply. Well, isn't it supposed to be a law of the market that uh, those who are able to produce more cheaply should be should be triumphant in the market? No, on the one hand, the U.S. administration and uh, officials like Ms. Yellen want to talk about the virtues of the market. On the other hand, they want to complain about the effects of the market. So that's the first thing. And of course, uh, uh, it's uh, the fact that China is able to produce these goods more cheaply only means that China has advanced uh, the productive capacities uh, uh, sufficiently far that these products are available really very cheaply. And the, in the United States, it's not just that it's because of higher wages in the U.S. that are they are av not, not available cheaply. It's also because the companies are unwilling to invest in the most efficient methods of production. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say is that what uh, Ms. Yellen is calling uh, overcapacity is really very important. Now, if you think about it, in one way, uh, overcapacity has been a problem play allegedly plaguing the world economy for ab about 50 years. One could say that the crisis of the 1970s emerged precisely because there was overcapacity and overproduction, particularly in relation to existing demand. Now, in itself, industrial capacity is a good thing. And to complain about overcapacity is to say that somebody else should shut down their productive capacity and allow our productive capacity to flourish. Well, there's instead of playing this kind of uh, zero-sum game, there's actually another way of dealing with it, which is why not expand global demand. Because if a, a global demand increases, then there would not be overcapacity. Indeed, if you think about it, considering that so much of the world lives in poverty, needs the roads, the, the green technology, the hospitals, the buildings, the uh, food, the clothing, all sorts of manufactured goods, the world needs more of it, of course, produced in a green way. So the problem is not overcapacity. And to frame it as a problem of overcapacity is to refuse to resolve the fundamental problem that has been plaguing the world economy for 50 years and more now, which is that there is deficient demand. And there is deficient demand because too much of the world is poor. So why not develop 
the productive capacities of the world and uh, 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 and and therefore the the ability to demand goods so that's the the first couple of points i wanted to make and there is also Another point I want to make, which is that, um, uh, uh, sorry, so so what Ms. Yellen is complaining about is that in China, there has been a rapid growth in three industries in particular, which Ms. Yellen is complaining about. First is battery production. The second is new, uh, 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 new vehicle production, new energy vehicle production. Uh, that's the red line. And finally, wind and solar power generation capacity. And you can see that in certainly in two of the three cases, and also in the third case, there have been remarkable increases in China's productive capacity since about 2020. So, uh, and this is what uh, Ms. Yellen is complaining about, but the fact is that China is making these products available to the rest of the world more cheaply, and this will only mean that the world can get on with the business of dealing with climate change more effectively. So, so, so that's also really quite important. And a third point I wanted to make is that this discourse about how China should be uh, uh, should not be exporting so much, and and is also a, a, a aligns with something else we discussed last time in considerable detail, which is that. Uh, the uh, Western uh, officials and uh, uh, are essentially saying that China is investing too much and consuming too little. So here's IMF uh, director Kristalina Georgieva. Uh, she recently made a number of pronouncements on China's growth. And she, uh, uh, among other things, she said China is poised to face a fork in the road, rely on policies that have worked in the past or update its policies for a new era of high quality growth. So basically, she's saying China should abandon the old policies which have worked and given it amazing growth. Then she says China could grow considerably faster than the, a status quo scenario. The additional growth would amount to 20% expansion of the real economy over the next 15 years, adding 3.5 trillion US dollars to the Chinese economy. So she's kind of dangling a statistical carrot saying, if you follow what I'm saying, you will benefit in these ways. But what is she actually asking China to do? She's asking China to increase domestic consumption and, uh, of course, in doing so, uh, increase income growth, which in turn, according to her, relies on increasing the productivity of capital and labor. And here's the key. Reforms such as strengthening the business environment and ensuring a level playing field between private and state-owned enterprises will improve the allocation of capital. And the fact of the matter is that uh, this advice is precisely the opposite of what has given China its amazing capacity to grow in the past. So really, as Michael said, not only is uh, uh, the our Westerners, Western leaders distorting the truth of China's growth and making the good in China look bad, they're actually giving bad advice to China. Well, uh, there's a reason that uh, China, uh, the consumption is not taken the form of uh, goods and services so much. And that's because the first uh, Chinese uh, demand is the uh, the same demand that uh, middle classes have all over the world. They want to buy the house. So uh, basically, uh, the problem the, of uh, increasing the domestic market is China has to solve the real estate problem. Uh, and that means uh, the real estate pricing problem, uh, the, the uh, idea of the mortgage credit problem. Uh, this is exactly what China is debating and trying to go through now. And I think it's some future program. We should go over that. It's a problem all in itself. Uh, but the there's no recognition in the IMF that uh, the one thing the IMF will never talk about and that economists don't talk about is the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. To them, all income is spent on goods and services. Uh, they, they, uh, they're not talking about uh, the uh, attempt to spend uh, goods, uh, um, income on, as they do in America, on debt service, on uh, buying a house uh, or uh, uh, renting a house. Uh, we've said before, and uh, just yesterday, uh, this week, uh, there was a new census of New York City. The average rent in New York City is $5,500 a month now. Well, how can America?
Africa and other cities actually compete when they have uh, such a, a high uh, a ki kind of rent. As long as economists, uh, IMF and the regular uh, professions don't realize that apart from uh, goods and services and uh, employers and wage earners, there's also uh, the financial sector, the insurance sector and the real estate sector, they're not going to have a realistic view of the economy. And in the US, as you pointed out at the beginning, it's the financial sector that says, you your income uh, to support the stock price, pay it out as dividends to raise the price and use stock buybacks. 91% of American uh, the uh, S&P 500 companies spend 91% of their profits on uh, pushing up the stock price, not R&D. That's happened for decades. That's why China and any other country that's following the Chinese model is, is going to increase its output uh, and why, if you follow the American model, you're deindustrializing. That's really what the whole fight uh, is uh, about. And uh, I don't know how uh, Miss Yellen uh, can bring this up uh, with Biden without uh, uh, other people at the uh, table just breaking out in laughter. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, there was a report just, uh, I think, this morning in the Financial Times, I couldn't find it just now, but it basically said that the amount of buybacks is reaching such absurd proportions that there's actually a dearth of equities to buy in the US market, because basically, they're, they're, they've been buying them at back at such a rate of knots. But uh, to come back to our main topic, I just want to share uh, this uh, 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 picture with you as well. This, re you know, the fact of the matter, is that China, precisely because it is pursuing policies that are opposed to the United States, today it has made bulk of the world, the bulk of the countries of the world, uh, have China as its main trading partner. So all the countries you see here, which are colored in red, their main trading partner is China. All the countries you see that are colored in blue, their main trading partner is the United States. And all the countries you see here colored in orange, their main trading partner is Germany. So the efficiency of Chinese production, the, bene the beneficence of the links it offers to the rest of the world is very clear from this little statement alone. And uh, probably, Michael, we should be winding down our conversation, but I didn't yep. want to wind it down without showing one uh, other thing, which is... Um, this uh, because you know you earlier talked about china's holdings of treasuries etc and i just wanted to show this chart which goes back to 2000 and uh, up to 2023 so you see here uh you from from the moment china entered the wto because china was essentially uh, uh, uh such a successful exporter and began to really dominate the world ex export markets the, the the flip side of that was its accumulation of us treasuries which reached a peak in the early 2010s, about 2011-2012 uh, uh, was when the US, China held the most U.S. treasuries, amounting to about $1.3 trillion. But since then, what we've seen is a relative decline of China's holdings of U.S. treasuries, so that today they are just a, a little over uh, a, a 750 a billion dollars. And here's um, the most recent figures that I could find are from Reuters. And Reuters says the latest figures show that China held 782 billion uh, of treasuries in November, a large amount, but also around its smallest in 15 years and down significantly from the peaks of 1.3 trillion in 2011 and 2013. More importantly, they say, China's footprint in the US bond market is a fraction of what it once was. China owns less than 3% of all outstanding treasuries, the smallest share in 22 years, and again substantially down from a record of 14% in 2011. So this shows on the one hand that, you know, we saw in the previous chart here, China has certainly decreased it, but uh, this is an absolute number. But as a proportion of the total outstanding treasuries, it is as small as 3%, because remember what has also been happening at the same time. The 
Federal Reserve has essentially been expanding its balance sheet, including by buying U.S. Treasuries, which nobody else will buy. So in my humble opinion, I have no doubt that one of the reasons why Madam Yellen has gone to Beijing to meet her various high ranking uh, Chinese officials and, 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 and politicians is because she wants China to step back into the Treasury market, because as we've pointed out earlier, the treasury market is not in good shape and it needs other buyers. At the moment, essentially, bulk of the U.S. treasuries are owned by American entities of which the Federal Reserve is a major part. Yeah, that's currency manipulation. That's what you're saying at the same time. Uh, I would have liked to see the chart on China's gold holdings because yesterday uh, gold hit an all-time record. Uh, and obviously, countries are seeing what the United States is doing to Russia and what it's doing in Palestine and the Near East. Uh, the, uh, they're all moving out of treasuries because the United States is going to do to other countries what it did to, to Russia. So, of course, no country wants to uh, put its money at risk by holding uh, dollars. That's all the shows we've done on de-dollarization. So you can see it all coming to a head right now. Well, uh, Michael, you wanted to see China's uh, gold reserves. I wouldn't say gold holdings, and I'll I'll show you. You wanted to see a chart, so I have summoned up a chart for you now. Where did it go? For just such purposes. Uh, where are we now? Um, hmm, show all windows. And here we go. So this is just from Trading Economics. This is the 2021 oh. figure. And you can see that China's gold oh. reserves, these are official holdings. Of course, China also has is a large a private market in gold. We are not showing no. you that. This is just China's gold reserves. And you can see that, yes, exactly. The, at the same rate at which China is dumping uh, uh, dollars or treasuries and not participating as much in the treasury market as it once did, it is also increasing its gold reserves. So, um, so Michael, shall we wrap up? Do you want to say any yeah. last few things? No, no you, you've, you've done it. Uh, uh, okay. We didn't even curse this. It's just a uh, natural flow of talk. Yeah, and well, I just wanted to say a, a couple of things, you know, um, that uh, 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 one of the things that uh, comes out uh, uh, in all of this, uh, or to me anyway, the takeaways is that the United States is essentially not only uh, uh, not only is its economy failing productively, but it seems unable even to undertake the industrial policy that will be necessary uh, for uh, to 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 make its industry more competitive, make its industry stronger, more make its industry more technologically uh, 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 competent. So so its capabilities are low. And what's more, I would add one final point, which is that I would say that given its present political structure, it doesn't seem as though the United States is even going to generate the political will to have industrial policy. Because you see, if you look at the history of industrial policy, we see that industrial policy and developmental states have been successful only in instances of uh, where there are non-capitalist uh, ruling classes, such as, for example, in late 19th century Germany or in, uh, uh, ch uh, in uh, the Soviet Union or today in China, which are able to impose a certain level of discipline on the capitalist classes. Um, uh, or where there is, you know, a, a socialist economy, which is ca capable of doing that. Whereas today in the United States, you have uh, and an, an, uh, you have a, a, a political structure which is completely dominated by politicians who will slavishly do what the corporate capitalist class will want. They have not got the capacity to control the capitalist classes for the greater good of the American economy and of the American people. This is the problem that they have. So if, uh, uh, Michael, you don't want to add anything, we will bring oh, this show no. to a close. Uh, I mm -hmm. wanted to say that uh, uh, we hope you, you enjoyed this. You, we hope you will like it uh, and please share it widely. And I also wanted to announce that in our next show, Michael and I, who've been uh, advising um, the uh, uh, candidate for the Green Party, the presumptive Green Party candidate for US President, Jill Stein, will be having a show in which we will be, uh, we will, she will be our guest. Uh, and we hope it, this will be a show in which we will discuss the broad outlines of her policy uh, uh, and what are the uh, obstacles that she faces as a third party candidate 
in the uh, US elections. So we hope you will join us. This should be up coming up in less than two weeks. So we look forward to doing that with you. Thank you and goodbye.